This is Nyashozi, a typical Tanzanian village near the shores of Lake Victoria. It is extremely isolated and its only access is by an unmetalled road, which is often washed away in bad weather. As in most parts of East Africa, the people of Nyashozi rely on plantains for their staple diet. These can be seen every day in the market and are the main crop of the local farmers. Plantains resemble bananas and in this part of Africa are referred to by that name. Unlike dessert bananas, which are generally eaten raw, plantains are sold while they are still green. Nyashozi is surrounded by small banana plantations which sustain the local economy. But there's a problem. Since 2001, these banana plants have been ravaged by a bacteria causing devastation in the growing regions of East Africa. The disease is commonly known as banana wilt. We can already count how many plants you can see physically that they are infected. Now, all these plants which are standing are not going to produce any food at all. Yeah. This is nearly mature, this banana here is nearly mature, but not fully, yet fully mature. So you have to wait maybe for maybe four weeks yeah. before you can harvest this one. But once diseased, this banana on, on the tree will turn yellow. Now, this one, which is still young, turn it yellow. You can see. This is a cooking banana, which it turned yellow before maturity. Before, before maturity. Now look at this one, this color. The stem is already rotten. It has a very bad smell. That is smelling horrible. Mm. You cannot eat it, you cannot cook it, even no animal can eat this one. Yeah. Joseph and David visit a typical yeah. farmer whose small banana plantation yeah. provides her only cash crop. Uh, only making guy. Uh, this lady is 75 years old and she has to attend this field. She's telling me that the wilt has really devastated her field. Unfortunately, many smallholders don't have the resources to carry out the work needed to stem the spread of this disease. This household is largely depending on this field, which is farm, uh, uh, bananas, and the maize, and a few coffee plants. Now, the banana wilt, how does it affect the plant? Now, we are standing in front of an infected plant. Uh, this banana tree, as you can see, the leaves are already turning yellow. But also this plant being here is a cause of infection for all other plants in the, in the field here. Yeah. In order to get it well, you have to cut it once. Like this one. Yeah. Now, we are looking at the meristem. The healthy plant, all this will be white. There's now oozing out a sort of sap which is smelling. Yeah. Now I've cut this banana with these tools, with this machete. Now if I use the same machete to chop another plant, yes. I've already spread the disease. So Some of the measures to counteract spread of the disease, for example, we say after chopping one, one plant, I have to treat it in a disinfectant or I have to put this in a fire. Ultimately, it's very likely that entire banana plantations will have to be cut down and the ground left for up to three months before disease-resistant strains can be planted. This is beyond the scope of most subsistence farmers. The disease is not only passed by contaminated tools, it can also be spread by pollinating insects or by the transplanting of diseased suckers. For example, if I want to establish a new farm, I'll just come on such a, a stool here and uproot the sucker. I'll uproot this sucker and go and plant it in another, in, a, in another hole. Taking off this sucker to plant it somewhere, this already diseased. So I'm starting off with a diseased plant. And if we cut this one down, you'll, you'll get a stinky, smelling, oozing liquid. This plant cannot be fed to anything. 
not to animals, nothing. It's only diseased. It's only, you know, it's useless. Across the border in Uganda, Dr. Andrew Kagandi, the director of genetics, explains the importance of bananas to the local population. So we harvest them green and we boil or steam and mash and something like mashed potato. And then you eat that with a sauce and we eat that every day of our lives. Around 2000, 2001 is when the, the real banana wilt happened. So I was away and a lot of my colleagues did most of the preliminary work on trying to find out what the wilt was, what the bacteria is, where did it come from. Initially the government committed quite a bit of money and effort to, to do whatever could be done. <clears throat> so in the main growing areas they had literary armies of communities, you know, going out there and scouting for the disease, making sure that the farmers are at least doing something, cutting down whatever is sick. And at the time we were telling people to bury, you know, dig a big hole and bury the sick plants or burn. But banana is very difficult to burn because it's all, you know, watery. But nevertheless, the control effort is uh, fairly strong. And uh, we think that we have to continue uh, doing the research, trying to find out how best to control this. It's difficult to use chemicals and farmers can't afford these things. So we have effort to, to breed and, 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 and see if in future we have varieties that are resistant. What we've done in terms of pushing tissue culture to the communities is at the lab level, we do the first stages which are quite sophisticated. And, you know, so then we can bring uh, these to, farm, to community gardens, to community nurseries. Using modern techniques in biotechnology, banana wilt resistant varieties are being developed through genetic modification. Field trials are proving successful. Dr. Jeffrey Aranatwi hopes that within a few years, in Uganda at least, existing plantations will be replaced with resistant plants. From the test tube, they, can't, they, they cannot survive outside in the harsh environment. So what we do, we first put, put them here, we separate these little ones into those pots that you see there. And at that age, they are ready to be planted in the field. So farmers can come and buy some. Joseph Sakiku runs a local radio station outside Nyashozi, which he uses to educate local farmers on the best way to prevent its spread. This is proving to be the most effective way of reaching the remote plantations where the people have no access to television or newspapers. Through interviews with those whose plantations are already affected by banana wilt and with expert advice on how to control the disease, farmers are being educated and encouraged to take an active role in the fight against this very real threat to their livelihoods. Joseph talks to many smallholders around Nyashozi and they show him how the disease is devastating their crops. In the short term, Tanzania faces a serious problem as banana wilt takes hold, robbing local people of their ability to feed themselves, pay for their children's education and provide an income. You see, it should be intact, but it's already splitting. Oh. To some farmer who a bit hesitant, say, oh, you leave my, my banana, maybe it will be okay. <laughs> but the fact is, it will not be okay. It never, it never, never survived to, to bring food. You can see how, how bad it is. Yeah, and this one had to be cut, ah. you can imagine. Hmm? So this is all loss. The government has to do something. So it is alarming that bananas have to vanish at such a speed, which means that we need a lot of interventions to be able to curb the situation before it is too late. Actually, it's already late as I can say, because uh, a very, very big population of uh, bananas is already affected. Uh, some in the early stages, but as, I, as you can see, there's very, very little hope, because the disease is now established within the bananas. Globally, there is an awareness of the ravages of malaria and HIV, 
but few realise the devastation that banana wilt is likely to cause in East Africa over the next few years.